it's time for you all to wake up and shift your paradigm. This world is the kingdom of darkness and we are living in its last days. It won't be long before the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth and everything therein shall be burnt up. The Luciferian elite have been setting up the new world order and now they've established the globalist beast system for the rise of that wicked one and revealing of the man of sin who comes after the workings of Satan. Don't take my word for it. Read the Bible. And you'll know that perilous times shall come in the last days. And we are in the last days. Modern Western medical thought says that sleep paralysis occurs when the brain awakes from the REM state, but the body is still in a state of paralysis, which they say prevents the body from manifesting movements made in the subject's dreams and thus causes hallucinations, mostly of, quote, evil presences in the room. Yet they freely admit that very little is known about the physiology of sleep paralysis, and that this is at best a guess. There are several problems with this theory. One is that if it is generally accompanied by the sense that there is something evil in the room, and if it were only the result of people dreaming, even though their body is still asleep, why is there more people reporting all kinds of very different dreams, as you would expect, as opposed to almost identical experiences with this evil presence? The same story, the same feeling, and sometimes the same entity are being described by people who have had no contact with one another, or who have ever heard of sleep paralysis before. I think it is helpful at this point to hear what other cultures have believed about sleep paralysis for hundreds of years. In the Persian culture, it's a, quote, ghost-like creature that causes sleep paralysis. In the Malaysian culture, they are reported as demonic figures. In Tamil and Sri Lanka, the translation of the term is a ghost that forces one down. In the Muslim culture, it's jinns or demons. In the Ethiopian culture, some form of evil spirit. In Zimbabwe and Shona culture, some spirit, especially an evil one. In Greece and Cyprus, it's a ghost-like creature or demon. In the southwest Nigeria region, it's a demon. In Maltese folk culture, sleep paralysis is attributed to ghosts. In Iceland folk culture, it's a goblin or succubus. In Chinese culture, it's literally translated as a ghost pressing on body. And similarly, in the Vietnamese culture, it's translated as held down by a ghost. Also in Hmong culture, translated as crushing demon. In Cambodian, Laotian, and Thai culture, it's attributed to ghosts. It may be tempting to dismiss these cultures' views about sleep paralysis because we think that our culture has grown out of a belief of demons. But if you have been experiencing sleep paralysis in your life, you know that the demon explanation shouldn't be thrown out quite so fast, regardless of what you think that you know about how the world works. I'm going to shoot straight with you. I know what sleep paralysis is, and I know how to stop it, and I've seen tons of people beat it for good. So bear with me as I explain all this, because I'm sure many of you will not like the truth about this. But this will be all the information that you will need to terminate sleep paralysis for good in your life. You may have guessed by now that sleep paralysis is caused by demonic presence in the room. There is some good news and bad news about this. The bad news is, is that demons are smart and deceptive and very evil. The good news is that there is a way to turn the tables on them and to make them the victims of your next encounter, as well as end it for good. If you have been researching possible causes of sleep paralysis from a Western medical perspective, you have found that everyone seems to be guessing and that no two answers are alike. I will tell you from my experience what the real causes of sleep paralysis are. I will list a few of the common causes. The most common that I have dealt with is people that have in some way been involved with, on various levels, even very light level, occult practices, such as the Ouija board, tarot cards, certain types of meditation, channeling, even obsessive research about the occult or UFOs can be the cause for some people. Generally, the deeper the person goes into the occult, the more, quote, doors that they open, and the more authority the demons gain over them, which can lead to severe physical attacks and even abductions. They are desiring to have more access to you, but they can't get that access to you unless you essentially give it away to them. And so they have kind of enticed us with a lot of different methods that kind of break down the natural protection we have 
against them. And as we continue to do those things that break down that barrier, they continue to have more access to them, to us rather. So that's why it tends to get more severe down the line if the person is still doing whatever it is that's opening these doors. You can't, as we're going to find out, just by stopping the thing in your life, we'll just call it what it is, the sin in your life, it's not going to make this stop forever. The way this works is the protection that you naturally have against these beings is kind of being chipped away. Those chips are permanent. You can't repair it yourself. They can be repaired. I want to let you know that this protection can be prepared, excuse me, repaired, but it's not going to be repaired just by stopping it. What you're going to do by stopping whatever it is that's being done is you're going to prevent it from getting any worse. And it will get worse if you continue to do this. In the cases of generational doorways, that is something that was opened by their parents or grandparents, usually in some kind of ritual or something, whether the, the parent or grandparent actually knew what they were doing or not, they were giving away their ownership of the child to the dark side, if you will, to the enemy. And it's not necessarily their fault in a lot of cases. They thought they were probably doing something good or whatever, but that's how this dark side operates. It tricks people into thinking what they're doing is good. But nevertheless, my point is that those doors tend to be pretty much the same, that they're going to stay the same level throughout the person's life unless the person opens up more doors as a result of that. Usually what happens or what happens a lot of times is that the person that has generational doors has been experiencing this since they were very young or sometimes they'll say as far as like they can remember, they've been having these supernatural experiences. And what they will interpret that as, and I would say they're encouraged to interpret it this way is that it's because they are naturally quote unquote gifted or psychic or, you know, whatever the, the person may be thinking that they are, you know, any number of things that makes them special. And that's an interesting idea because it makes the person want to go in further. Okay. Now I'm super special. So I want to go look into this more. I want to be use this gift that I have. And so then they will open up the doors wider because now it's them opening the doors. They're trying to look into occult things and they, because they think that they have a particular talent for it. So a lot of times what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the doorways are not going to get any worse unless in a generational case, unless you begin to open them yourself through the very, the same practices that other people make them worse. What does the Bible say about things like magic and the occult? In Leviticus 19.31, it says, Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. So God basically says here, don't have anything to do with psychics or mediums. And also notice that he says that they would defile us in some way. So we're going to look a little more in detail into that aspect in just a minute. But first, let's look at some other verses. Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 through 14 says, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or a spiritist who consults with the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. And because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. And as you can see here, there's a ton of other verses that also show the exact same thing, that the occult in its various forms are bad and that God doesn't want us doing them. So one of the questions I had is, why is it bad? Surely God has a good reason why he doesn't want people to do this stuff. I mean, I think that we should obey God either way. But from what I know about God in my own life, whenever he forbids us to do something in his word, it is because that doing it would harm us in some way. See, he created everything. He knows how everything works. He knows how stuff like mediums and psychics and all that occult stuff works. So it also stands to reason that he knows that something about all that stuff would harm us if we did it. So in order for us to understand why all this stuff is bad and to understand how it all works, we need to do a quick study about the forces that are behind it all. There's a branch of theology called demonology, and it's basically the study of demons. The Bible says a whole lot about demons, so we can understand things about their characteristics and things about their motivations. For instance, we find that they have intelligence. In fact, we find that they're very smart. And a lot of times we find that they use that intelligence to be deceiving, deceptive. I have here also that they empower psychic ability. And what I mean by that is that we see in the Bible people that 
can tell fortunes or psychics, it says that they can do so because they have a demon. In fact, in Acts 16.16, 16, Paul casts a demon out of a woman and she's no longer able to do this. And we're going to look at that a little later. Satan and his angels can talk and shout. Moving on, um, it says that they seek and accept worship. That is, that they desire to be worshipped and that they can also receive that worship, usually in the form of them indwelling idols. Uh, they can perform lying signs and wonders. They are very powerful. They can do supernatural things. And they are subject to Christians. What I mean here is that the Lord has given Christians his full power and authority over all demons so that they should not harm us, as it says in Luke 10, verse 19, and many other places. And we're going to look at that in greater detail as we continue. So the question is, how do they start to be able to manifest or mess with people and even possess people? What do people do to open up the doors in their lives to these demons? Now, keep in mind, there are various levels or degrees that demons can mess with people. It almost never starts out in full-blown possession. And the stages have been described as oppression sometimes. This is kind of, they're able to sort of mess with you, make you feel bad and things like that. Attachment is kind of a more severe version of that. And then finally, possession, like we see with the guy among the tombs in Mark chapter 5. And we're not told exactly how one begins to open these doors in their lives, but we do find a lot of clues, like Judas is a good example. Now, it says that he was possessed by Satan himself the night that he betrayed Jesus. And we know that Judas had opened up his heart to evil, possibly with greed issues. We find that in John twelve six because he was stealing from the money bag and things like that. So sin in general can be a way to open up doors slightly. Uh, severe anger can open up a door. We find in Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27. From missionaries' experiences, demon possession also seems to be related to the practicing of magic and the worshiping of false gods in different cultures and things. Scripture repeatedly relates idol worship to the actual worship of demons. We see this in Leviticus 17, 7, Deuteronomy 32, 17, Psalm 106, 37. And an interesting one, I think, is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, where Paul says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. But what by far opens the biggest doors of all, and what we're going to be talking about today, can pretty much be summed up in that list that we read earlier in Deuteronomy, which says, quote, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist. Now, these are the things that we find open up the big doors in people's lives. And the more that they do them, the wider the doors open. This concept will really help you understand all the issues that we're going to be talking about today. God set up this world, and he gave us free will, the ability to make our own choices. Now, he warned us, he told us not to do certain things, because he knew that those things would harm us. But he wanted to allow us to make our own decisions. It's all about human free will in one sense. God's given us the opportunity to choose to love him, and he's also given us lots of opportunities to choose different things in the context of that. Ephesians 4.27 says, Neither give place to the devil. This means that we can, in some way, give place to the devil. And what that word for place is, is a Greek word called topos. And what it means is an opportunity, power, or an occasion for acting. There are certain things that we can do to give these demons an occasion for acting in our life. And the Bible says, don't do that. Now, the demons have a rule, too. And it seems that they require humans' free will in order to control or to mess with them or to manifest or to possess a person. That means that they need to trick a person into inviting them in. Because most people aren't going to knowingly ask for a demon to come into their life. And in just a minute, we're going to talk about the many different ways that demons trick people into doing just that, inviting them into their lives. But first, I want you to notice that they have a motive. Because unlike angels who seem to have bodies, when we see demons in the scripture, they're always seeking to get in somebody else's body. They don't have bodies themselves. They seem to be almost desperate to be in a body. Actually, anybody, animal or human, will do. In Mark 5, they practically begged Jesus to send them into some pigs when he cast them out, because apparently pigs must have been much better than nobodies at all. So what is the alternative for them? Jesus describes their realm as dry places in Matthew twelve forty three. He says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. So they want in very badly, but they can't get in unless people ask them in. So they trick us into asking for them. 
And they know that most people won't call out and summon demons directly, like actually some Satanists really do that. So they find other ways for most people. And there are lots of other ways out there. So let's take a look at a few. And there are things like this, the Ouija board. And it's supposed to allow you to communicate with the spirit world, right? Well, it does in a sense. Um, but here's the secret about the Ouija board. It's just cardboard and paint. It has no special power of its own. It's just a way to get humans to ask for contact with spirits in their hearts, even though they might not necessarily say that with their mouths. What I mean is that when you sit down and you're playing with the Ouija board with your friends or you go get your tarot card reading the psychic or whatever, what you're saying in your heart is, spirits, I want to know what you have to say. I want to contact you. I want you to be here. I want to hear what you have to say. You're giving them in your heart the only thing that they need. Their only rule is that they need your free will. They need you to invite them. And that's what things like the Ouija board and tarot cards are doing. They're tricking you into giving away your free will. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you can be fully possessed by a demon at this point. As I said, something like full possession almost never happens all at once. It usually happens in stages. This may allow them to start harassing you or causing supernatural things to happen in your life. Usually what they try to do then is they try to use that little door in your life to trick you into giving them an even bigger door. A really good example of them using a little door to trick you into opening up a big door is with the New Age practice of meditation. When someone first gets involved with meditation, they'll tell you what you need to do is to clear your mind totally of anything. You've got to really practice on getting everything out of your mind. You must not have any will of your own. You need to be open to anything. Note that the person may not, like in the case of the Ouija board, be expecting the spirit to show up. But notice that the emphasis is still very much on the human free will. In this case, all the meditation techniques say to work at totally getting rid of your free will, to be completely passive, open to whatever happens. And this is sometimes called the passivity of will. Now, getting rid of your own free will is like letting down your guard. It's like telling a security guard to go take a break. <laughs> because your will is out of the way, it allows demons to affect you, even if they usually can only affect you very slightly at this point. But I want you to see what they do with this little tiny open door that people innocently give them, and how they use it to create a big door later on. What normally happens in the case of meditation is that the demons will use this state of the person, having their free will guard completely down, to do something supernatural feeling to them. As I mentioned, they don't have much access to the person at this point, but the passiveness of the will has given them just enough of a right to do something supernatural. So people usually report a supernatural feeling of some kind, maybe an intense, unexplained emotion. It can be a vision. Several people have reported hearing voices. And this makes the person say, wow, this meditation thing is the truth. I've literally felt it work. Now, this makes the person start to try to find out more about meditation, to go even deeper into meditation, and to get more of the power that they think is available if they go further into meditation. That initial supernatural feeling is kind of like the bait at the end of the fish hook. And there's no shortage of books and websites out there that tell you what you must do to go even further and to get the most out of your meditation and how to get the real power. And what they start to tell you is that in order to get the most out of your meditation, you need to start to call on spirits. Now, all these folks have different versions of what the spirits are. None of them would say that they're demons. Instead, they call them things like spirit guides or angels or archangels or ascended masters or even dead relatives. But here's some quotes from some websites. And notice that they're telling the person to ask for the contact. Remember, from the Ouija board example, that's all they really need. They need you to ask for them in some way. This meditation website says, set your spiritual intent to contact your spirit guide. If you like, do a prayer to ask for spiritual support as you make contact with your spirit guide. Inwardly call in your spirit guide. Start to open up your awareness of their presence. You may see them, feel their presence, hear them communicating, or somehow just know that they're there. As spirits say hello to your spirit guide. Allow yourself to receive a hello back from your spirit guide. So many of these things are appealing to the will of the person in this quote. Inwardly call in your spirit guide. Set your spiritual intent to contact your spirit guide. These are picture-perfect example of what demons need. And here's another quote from a meditation website. It says, And as we continue to breathe in and out very deeply, we 
call upon your guardian angels and the archangels to make their presence known? So you can see that at least in some cases, meditation leads to the very same place, getting people to invite spirits into their lives. So let's move on and let's talk about psychics and ghosts and seances and all that stuff. What you need to know is it's not even really that complicated how demons can tell us things about our lives that no one else knows. It's not because they can read your mind or they can tell the future. In fact, I think that Daniel 2 verses 27 and 28 and other places show us that they cannot do this. It's all basically because they watch us. I'm not sure if we have certain demons that are assigned to us, like C.S. Lewis envisioned in his book, The Screwtape Letters, or if they alternate or whatever. The scripture doesn't really say. But they do observe us, and they know things about you that nobody else knows. They know what you ate for breakfast. They listen to you tell your friend that secret that nobody else knows but you and them. They know things that you're really interested in. So if you go and you talk to a psychic, and that psychic has her own life massively opened up to demons through the occult practices that she does, and they can communicate with her, they communicate to her the things about you that seem very impossible for the psychic to know. And she, like the lady in Acts, makes much gain from this. Another aspect of this is that demons communicate with one another. They network with one another, if you will. So, for instance, if you asked a psychic that something only your great, 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 great grandmother could have known, like where is the will hidden or something like that, the demon that was observing your great, 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 great grandmother hide that will knows where it is. And so this explains things like seances, where people go and they try to make contact with what they think are their dead relatives. What they're actually contacting is something I believe are called familiar spirits in the Bible. I've seen so many people stuck in the occult because of this trick. They've been told something about their loved one that has passed that only they could have known. And so it proves to them whatever else was told to them. Now, the Bible says that it is appointed for man once to die and then to face judgment. It also says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we're going to understand a lot more about this as we look at the next topic, ghosts. Now, there are a number of TV shows out there nowadays that go around looking for ghosts. And while I think there is some fakery going on with some of those shows, I also think that there are some genuine supernatural things that are going on in other of those cases. Oftentimes, if a place is haunted, like a room or an entire house, it's not because someone died there or any of the other reasons that people on those shows say, but it's because rituals have been done there. Sometimes they can be satanic ritual sites or more commonly things like seances or other types of summoning of spirits. The demons are territorial. They go only where they've been given the authority to go, like we see in Mark 5 with the pigs. That's why sometimes only certain rooms are haunted. Only certain rooms have had rituals and things done in them. More often than that, however, that is, in most cases, it is not the house that is haunted at all, but the person, if you will. I've heard people say to me that they moved from house to house and from city to city, and all the houses that they moved in were haunted. Scary things would happen. They would see and hear things all the time. Now, in that case, it was because they had opened up themselves to the demonic realm by their practicing magic and other occult things. They themselves were the problem, not the house. It's really important to realize that in these haunting cases, the demons are playing a kind of game. They want you to believe a different version of the world than the one that is in the Bible. They want people to believe that the afterlife is not based on the Bible or based on Jesus at all, and that it's about reincarnation, or they offer lots and lots of different alternatives and stories. Like at seances, the so-called ghosts always come up with a different version of what the afterlife is really like, and that's why there's a million different books on what the afterlife is like, because the demons are always telling just a random story. Whatever the person is into, they'll say, well, it's about whatever you're into, you know, magically. So the people think, okay, well, maybe the afterlife isn't like the Bible, and they start their drifting away from the Lord and they start getting into the things of the occult because, well, this is where the truth is. Maybe I should start studying about this and getting more into this and those kinds of things. Aliens. So what does the Bible say about life on other planets? It doesn't say anything for or against, really. I suppose that it's possible that God could have created an infinite number of planets like Earth, but the Bible simply doesn't say. But I can be sure that the phenomenon that we've been seeing for the last 60 years or so, the UFOs that people report and the alien abduction testimonies that we hear, are definitely not from beings from other planets. 
Let me read some quotes from people who've been studying this alien phenomena that we've been experiencing. Now, these are people that are not necessarily Christians, but they are really big names in UFO research, and they do a lot of study about it. They say things like, One theory, which can no longer be taken very seriously, is that UFOs are interstellar spaceships. Arthur C. Clarke said this in the New York Times Book Review. Also, George Crichton in a 1992 Flying Saucer Review policy statement says, there seems to be no evidence yet that any of these craft or beings originate from outer space. This is an interesting one from Lynn Cato in a report that she did for the U.S. Air Force. It says, a large part of the available UFO literature is closely linked with mysticism and the metaphysical. It deals with subjects like mental telepathy, automatic writing, and invisible entities, as well as phenomena like poltergeists, manifestations, possession. Many of the UFO reports now being published in the popular press recount alleged incidents that are strikingly similar to demonic possession and psychic phenomena. Here's an interesting one. Dr. Pierre Guerin says, UFO behavior is more akin to magic than to physics as we know it. The modern UFO knots and the demons of past days are probably identical. John Keel said, the UFO manifestations seem to be, by and large, merely minor variations of the age-old demonological phenomenon. Trevor James says, a working knowledge of occult science is indispensable to UFO investigation. Another one that I think is really interesting is with Whitley Strieber. He's possibly the most famous alien abduction case, and he wrote the book Communion, which was wildly successful. He says, I felt an absolutely indescribable sense of menace. It was hell on earth to be there in the presence of the entities. And yet I couldn't move, couldn't cry out, couldn't get away. I lay as still as death, suffering inner agonies. Whatever was there seemed so monstrously ugly, so filthy and dark and sinister. Of course they were demons. They had to be. And they were here, and I couldn't get away. And I think that the best evidence of all is the fact that certain people that have experienced so-called alien abduction have reported that when they called out to Jesus, the attacks totally stopped. It didn't matter if they thought they were on some spaceship being tortured or whatever. They were immediately back in their bed. Oftentimes, people experiencing this are people that have been heavily involved in the occult or magic, and there are a few other reasons, but the large majority of them have opened up doors in their life in this way. I personally know the people involved with the ministry to help people experiencing these attacks, and they now have hundreds of testimonies of people on their CE4 Research Group website of people that have ended these encounters with these demonic beings by calling out to Jesus and ending them for good by giving their lives to him. Their mission statement on their website says, The mission of CE4 Research Group is to share with the world the most powerful evidence known that exposes the alien entities for who they really are. That evidence is in the testimonies of those who have overcome the experience, the oppression, the bondage, the harassment, the control, the lies, the deception that these entities perpetrate by calling out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Through this evidence of the testimonies, we will be able to help others. The world asks for this evidence, and we will give it to them. We share this evidence through any means of communication available. 2 Corinthians 11 says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Satan and his demons can pretend to be good. They can literally change their appearance and pretend to be whatever the person is interested in. Now, they can't just show up to anybody on the street, and the person has to be doing this occult type of stuff before they can manifest. First Timothy 4, one says, In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I think this shows that these spirits are seductive and that they, in fact, write doctrines of some kind, or convey doctrines at the very least. Now, oftentimes, when someone lets a demon into their life, the demons want people to go out and spread the message that they told them. They want them to start a blog, or start a publishing company, or they want them to go out on a world stage and go on the lecture circuit, and all this stuff. But the messages that they want people to spread usually can be summed up in about five different main messages. They they kind of mix and match, but it usually has something to do with one of these five messages. Number one is that you are God or you can be like God if you do certain things. Now, this is an old trick of Satan. And I'm sure people remember that way back in the Garden of Eden, Satan said, when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So one of the first lies ever recorded was Satan telling humans that they could be like God. 
Uh, the next one is that there is a coming age of enlightenment or an evolution of humanity. And this is actually what the term new age means. Uh, the next one is that aliens are somehow our genetic ancestors and then we can become like them. Almost every movie for the past 20 years has had some kind of theme like this. Uh, the reason it's so important, in my opinion, is that if you believe that aliens are real and they are in some way our creators, then you have to throw away God. And if the aliens are simply more evolved than us, then we would naturally think that we one day could be evolved like them. That We could gain all the powers and the technology like them if we evolve to their level. The next one is that there are certain people that are holding us back from the evolution. And this is a really scary one if you think about it. Uh, when you read these things that they, they're saying in these writings, it's, it's, it's really awful because they're talking about how there's a certain group of people out there, which usually means Christians, that believe in these old fairy tales of the old age and that they simply won't go along with this new evolution. And they say that those people must be destroyed before the evolution can really begin. And the final thing is that magic and the occult practices are good. There are just many books and movies and television shows, even on the Disney Channel, that are saying that magic is good, it's a way to get power and all this stuff. And this one is obvious. We've been talking about it. Demons don't have a way to access us unless we start to do these things and give them legal rights. And so they trick us into doing these things and making us think that these things are good so that they can begin to mess with us and draw us in even further and open up bigger doors. Yes, there is some supernatural things that happen. But if you know that those supernatural things are the result of demonic activity, it's really not that mystical or fascinating, and it's obvious why we shouldn't do them. So if you don't fall into any of these categories, email us at help at stopsleepparalysis.org, and we will help you. Sleep paralysis is often tied to astral projection, or leaving your body, because they are done in the same way. That is through the help of demonic presence even though the people that are usually doing it are deceived into thinking that they are doing it on their own. But that is why it is so easy to leave your body during these episodes, because the source of the ability is in the room with you. You will find that many people tell others to embrace this ability when they are having sleep paralysis episodes. Please don't listen to them. This is extremely unwise and will cause more and more severe sleep paralysis episodes down the line. The short answer to how these experiences are stopped is through the authority of the real Jesus Christ. The doubts that you may have about this will vanish as soon as you see the reaction of the demons to this authority. The mechanics of this start with Jesus himself. In Luke 9, verse 1, it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons. And in 1 John 3, verse 8, it says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And again in Luke 10, verses 19-20, through 20, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Jesus says he has given this authority to us, that is, to Christians. But calling out for Jesus' help will stop the individual sleep paralysis experience, even if the person is not a Christian, as long as the person is calling out in sincerity and not using it as a magic word. In fact, the Bible warns specifically about doing this very thing. In Acts 19, there were some people that saw that the apostles of Jesus had been given this authority over the demonic realm, and they tried to use it for themselves, even though they didn't believe. It says, In the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. The seven sons of Shiva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. So be careful if you're not a Christian and using the authority of Christ. Make sure that you are calling on the real Christ in sincerity for his help. Sometimes, during sleep paralysis, it is difficult to call out with your mouth or to think of the words to say. But even if you can only think of one word, let it be calling out on the name of Jesus for help. If you cannot use your mouth, ask God to give you the use of your mouth. I have even heard of a woman spelling out with her pinky finger the name of Jesus and stopped the experience. Probably even more important than what you say when attacked by demons is your unwavering commitment to say it every time it happens. This is because once they know for sure that you are the kind of person that will boldly use the authority Jesus has given you every single time, they will stop bothering you altogether. This is a crucial key to stopping sleep paralysis for good. Obviously, sometimes you won't be able to speak during sleep paralysis, which is fine. Simply think this phrase or a similar phrase, whatever you can think of at the time. 
even if it's just the name Jesus. But after you're able to speak, rebuke them in Jesus' name or send them to the abyss in Jesus' name. Do this even if the attack is totally over and everything is back to normal. Take a few minutes and let them have it. If they're going to attack you through sleep paralysis, then don't let them get away with it without causing them some trouble, too. We call this making a reputation in hell. Be the kind of person that makes demons cringe when they hear that they have to go to your house on an assignment. Trust me, eventually your reputation gets out and the attacks will stop. A word of warning and encouragement for the first time. Though this is not always the case, the first time you try using the authority that Jesus has given you on a demon, it may try to act like it doesn't bother them. Trust me, it's an act and it's taking everything they have to hold it together. This usually is only possible because the first time a Christian tries to rebuke a demon, they are usually not very confident, or they might not be saying anything that is particularly harmful to them. The demons have to use this opportunity of your weak attempt to try to scare you back into your shell. Don't fall for this age-old trick. You have to realize that they never wanted you to figure this out. It's game over for them if you do. So the last card that they can play is trying to make you think it doesn't work in hopes that you will never try it again. I promise you the name and authority of Jesus is the absolute worst thing in the world for them. The bolder and more confident you become in using the authority of Christ, the more success you will have. Closing the doors. Defense. So far we've only dealt with one side of the equation, the offensive side. Becoming a bold spiritual warrior in the name of Jesus Christ is very important, but doing this will not actually heal any of the wounds in your natural protective barrier that we have talked about. The doors can still be open. In this section, we will discuss how to close them for good. Depending on what was done to open the doors in the first place, this process can range from easy to very difficult. In some cases, particularly people that have been severe occultists in the past, their wounds and their spiritual protective barrier may require a bit more healing. For these people, they will need to follow these instructions very carefully, and not to be discouraged if the process takes time. In some ways, I've found that the people who have had the most damage to this protective barrier to end up being the best Christians, partly because they need more help from Jesus in order to be healed, which causes them to pray more and generally be better Christians. Some of the greatest Christians I know are former witches and Satanists. Jesus tells us in Luke 7, 39-50 that it's often the people who have been forgiven the most that love him the most. Obviously, the first step is to stop doing the things that open up doors. This might require help from the Lord to do, especially if there is addiction involved. The Bible says in James 4, 7, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's a light at the end of the tunnel of sinful desires. God will take them away from you, but you need to resolve to stopping them. You need to declare war on your sin. There is hope. Renouncing. Some people put a lot of emphasis on renouncing previous ties to sin, especially in cases where generational doors may have been opened, saying things in prayer like, Lord, I renounce anything that was done on my behalf by any family member or anyone else, and I forgive them for doing it, for they were deceived. Also, for a more general renouncing, you may simply ask for forgiveness for all that you've done in the past. The Bible says that you will be forgiven for it all. 1 John 1, nine says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Consistent Prayer One of the most important things to do if you want to close the doors and experience healing is talk about it with the Lord. He is the one from whom your healing will come. And though sometimes he does this instantaneously, other times he wants to do this through a slower process. I think this is because the time that you spend with him in prayer, seeking healing, is time you cultivate your relationship with him, and prayer is the main way in which this happens. I suggest that you pray specifically for help closing the doors that have been opened, and not just once or twice. Even if you only pray about one thing every single day, let it be about this issue. Ask him to close the doors and heal you. As I said, healing when it comes will come from his hand. And this is often accomplished through consistent prayer. Prayer is also helpful to prevent sleep paralysis. I recommend praying about this before you go to bed. Pray for protection or pray that if you do get sleep paralysis, that God would give you the ability to speak so you can begin the process of rebuking demons, which, as we have seen, will lead to your freedom from sleep paralysis. Give your shares to him. Opening doors is a lot like selling shares to a company. Imagine that your life consists of a certain amount of shares. If you sell too many of them, someone else will have the majority control over the company. Satan tricks people into selling him shares of your life a little at a time. For example, say you played with the Ouija board once at a party. That's like selling him two or three shares. Not that many as compared to the whole, but it's some. 
Over the course of your life, you get tricked into selling him more shares, and he gains more and more authority in your life. If you were, for example, a severe occultist, you have sold him so many shares that he has a great deal of authority in your life. The problem is that you can't get those shares back from him. He's not willing to sell them. But you need them back. So what are you going to do? You can't take them back from him and keep them. But you can sell the whole company, even the shares that Satan has accumulated, to another owner. You can give your entire life to Jesus. Give him total control. You can take those shares from Satan and give them all to a good and loving master, a person who loves you more than anybody else could possibly love you, cares for you, knows everything about you, and wants what's best for you. This is something that's done with the heart. You're essentially saying, I want Jesus to be the boss. Jesus is going to be the Lord of my life now. I'm going to try to figure out what he likes and what he doesn't like in the Bible, and I'm just going to follow him. The speed in which you heal the doors is often related to the degree that you make Jesus the Lord of your life. If you are not a Christian, even though you may have won the battle by calling out for Jesus' help and sincerity, they will keep coming back, as they still have authority over you, because either you or someone else has given it to them. They will continue to have this until you renounce them and give your life to Jesus, who will not only set you free of this kind of bondage, but will give you a new power to love Him and to love truth and to have total peace and joy. This is what you must do to end sleep paralysis for good in your life. Number one, recognize. You must recognize what it is. Demons. Number two, responsibility. You must take responsibility for what you recognize. Number three, repent. Repent to God for participating with what you recognize. It says in the Bible, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The Bible also says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number four, renounce. You must make what you recognize, your enemy, and renounce it. This is especially important if there is a generational sin that is going on. Renounce anything that has been done by anyone in your family, and ask Jesus to help close those doors. He is faithful to do so. Number five, remove it. Get rid of it once and for all. You must close the doors. Don't leave the doors half open. Close and lock them and throw away the key. Number six, resist. When it tries to come back, resist it. You must be bold if they come back. I have heard of someone's last experience with them being when they decided to start commanding them to go to the, quote, abyss with the authority of Christ. Show no mercy on them. They must obey the authority of Christ. Number seven, rejoice. Give Jesus thanks for setting you free. And number eight, restore. Help someone else to get free. The bottom line is to give your life to Jesus and to let him give you his strength to become what you can't be without him. He will change you from the inside out and give you the power to become more like him, which will set you free. So in conclusion, Jesus is the answer. He is our hope. He is our protector. The darkness of Satan and his whole kingdom is absolutely terrified of the light of Jesus and his kingdom. And if you ever find yourself in a situation where you feel the presence of evil at all, remember that you can call out in Jesus' name for help, just like Paul did in the book of Acts when he said, Paul, being grieved, turn and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And you can also pray against evil forces. You know, if you know somebody that's involved with all this stuff, you can not only pray for the Lord to help them and for their salvation, but you can also use the authority that the Lord has given every Christian to pray against the evil forces in their life. So don't get into any of these things that we've talked about today. They are all, without any exception, in some way or another, trying to get you to turn away from Jesus and turn towards the things that will benefit Satan and the Antichrist. Ephesians 5.11 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them. Thanks for your time.